principle in a kingdom way that Jesus was teaching his disciples because in this uh, particular portion of scripture there was a bit of a scuffle and and an argument between the disciples over a lady that had brought some very expensive perfume and she had poured it on Jesus's head and they were kind of in a, um, a turmoil of how that should have been done or how that should have been spent and Jesus was trying to give them a kingdom perspective of how that it was done. And I want to say to you this morning that there's nothing wrong with being a giver. I hope you know that. There's nothing wrong. I hope you have generosity in your heart. However, if you do not know how to give and what to give, wrong things will happen. Maybe credit cards, for instance. Maybe your, your spending habits are bigger than your pocketbook. And maybe, uh, maybe you're giving to the wrong things and, you know, credit creditors are coming after you because you're not giving to the right things. You're giving to things of the world and things that are going to pass away. But the way we give to the world should not be similar to how we give to God. And I think that's how as Christians we get confused sometimes. So here's what I mean. Kingdom giving is not inspired by the way you feel. It's based on who is worthy of the honor. And in this and in this case, Jesus is the one worthy of honor. Is he speaking to your heart to say, hey, this is how I want you to give. This is what I want you to do. Live by kingdom principles. Kingdom giving is not influenced by the words of people, but it is moved by the words of King Jesus. How, how are we listening to him? How are we listening and obeying his promptness to give and to follow biblical principles of even tithing? The principles, principles of the kingdom giving are not focused on the needs of people. It's focused on the righteousness of people's character. When we're in right standing with the Lord, we have the character of Jesus, and that's who we follow in giving. People who give under the confines of the kingdom uh, of the kingdom of God will always be misunderstood by carnal-minded people. People's always going to tell you, you don't need to be given to that church. You don't need to be doing this. You don't need to be doing that. It will always be misunderstood. But when you are giving kingdom-minded, it doesn't matter what the carnal-minded people are saying because we're giving kingdom-minded. So that's where we want to focus on. And I want to encourage you today. Maybe your maybe your giving's not been focused being kingdom-minded. I'm going to challenge you to shift that focus today and begin giving kingdom-minded. Begin giving kingdom-minded in, in how he would have you give. When's the last time you stopped and said, God, what would you have me give today? What would you have me do? How would you want me to help advance your kingdom in this moment today? So I want to leave that with you as a challenge and as something to maybe to make you think about how our, our spending and how, who we're giving to is really influencing the people around us. Our section leaders are going to come forward. They're going to be passing some buckets. There's also some ways to give on the screen here. You can uh, go to the Connection app. You can text in uh, the Connection KY to the 77977. Or if you're watching online and you want to mail your giving, you can send it at the 220 South Mayo Trail address. Let's pray before we give. Father, we just thank you for today, for this honor to be in your house, to be in your presence. Lord, it's it's just something that we uh, are thankful that we get to do together and not take for granted. So as we give today, we thank you for the kingdom funding that's happening, God, and how you're speaking to our hearts and how we are obeying. God, we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After you give, let's just stand together and worship again. So thankful that Jesus paid it all. He paid everything that we owe.
The crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Is anybody thankful that he did that for you, that he paid all of your debt, and there's not anything left that you and I need to pay on our own with our actions or our good behavior to try and pay the debt to be right in the eyes of God. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. Amen. Amen. Let's give him one more praise this morning. You can be seated in the presence of God today. I want to ask you a question as we get into the message this morning as we're continuing this week six in our series, Upside Down, Inside Out. We're examining verse by verse through Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. I want to ask you a question. Is it possible for someone to exercise without posting a selfie of it on social media? I mean, I know theoretically it should be possible. I just don't know that there's evidence to that fact. The reason for me to pose that question to you is going to be clear here in just a moment. In Matthew 6, last week we wrapped up Matthew 5, the opening chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, Jesus' focus of the content 
of the Sermon on the Mount changes. Previously, he had been dealing with how do kingdom people relate to each other? How do kingdom people relate to others who are not yet in the kingdom of God? How do we re- relate to our enemies? Uh, but in the beginning of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus shifts the focus to how do kingdom people relate to God? How do we relate to our king? In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 1, Jesus says this. If you have your Bible, why don't you find it and look there with me. Uh, we're going to be covering 18 verses of Scripture today. I promise it's not going to be taxing. We're not going to read all through uh, 18 verses straight. But we're going to begin here in verse number 1. If you have your Bible or have a device, if you don't have it, you can follow on the screens. Matthew 6, 1, Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Beware of posting your fitness selfie. (laughs) This is what Jesus is saying. Beware. You can work out. Or you can work out just to be noticed by people. You can work out to be healthy. You can work out to improve your overall health, your longevity, your uh, flexibility, your cardiovascular endurance. Or you can work out just to be seen and thought of as a person who's into fitness. A couple of weeks ago, I ordered for Malia and I a rower, a home exercise thing, Nordic track rower. And it is kicking my butt. I mean that in a literal and a metaphorical sense. Uh, I love it. I love it. Uh, At any given moment, I could be exercising with a trainer who is leading me through rows in Portugal or Glacier National Park, and the scenery is incredible, and background music and all that kind of stuff. Now, I could do the row exercises every morning. Um, just to post videos of it and say, here's me at Glacier National Park. Here's my little shorty shorts. You know, if I see my leg hair, I could, I, I could post the pictures of that. And, or I could just, you know, leave my phone where it's at and focus on improving my health. And nobody know anything about it. Jesus says you can do spiritual things for the purpose of everybody thinking you're spiritual, or you can do spiritual things because it increases your relationship with God. Now, Jesus says this. Jesus says this, beware of practicing your righteousness. That that is a little bit of an odd phrase, practicing your righteousness. How do we practice righteousness? Well, understand you receive righteousness. By trusting in Jesus. You and I don't originate righteousness. Our righteousness, the Old Testament says, is like filthy rags. So we, you and I do not originate righteousness. The only way that we have righteousness, which literally just means right standing before God. The only way you and I have righteousness is by trusting in Jesus' life, his sinless life, his death, burial, and resurrection. When we put our complete trust, not just for eternity, but day by day, minute by minute, when we trust in Jesus, sinless life, his death, burial, and resurrection, then his righteousness is given to you. He takes your and I's sinfulness away, and he gives us his righteousness that you are able to stand before God just as holy and in right standing the same as Jesus is in right standing before the Father God. Now, we receive that righteousness, but then practicing righteousness is the habits and the actions that we do because we've received righteousness. We don't do things to be righteous. We do these things because we're righteous. Another way of saying it is if I'm in sin... I practice sin. I'll do habits and behaviors that are sinful because I'm in sin, because I'm a sinner. Uh, someone goes to, to medical school or you're going to nursing school or something to, to learn medicine, but then you go practice medicine. 
you have the knowledge of medicine, then you practice medicine. Someone goes to law school to get the knowledge of law and to be licensed and then practices the law. You practice medicine because you have the knowledge of medicine. You practice sin because you have knowledge of sin. You practice righteousness because you have the knowledge of righteousness. So this is what Jesus is talking about when he's saying practicing righteousness. It's the habits and behaviors that result from the righteousness that you've received. And then Jesus goes on to highlight three things, three habits and behaviors, three things that were central and core to the Jewish religion that understand this, Jesus expected his followers to continue. Jesus is dealing with three things that they were already doing as practitioners of the Jewish religion, three things he's saying that he expects his followers who are Christians, that you'll continue doing these three, these three, these these three things. And here's what they are, giving, praying, and fasting. The Jewish audience that's hearing Jesus, they were already giving, they were already praying, and they were already fasting. But Jesus is drilling deeper on it, and he's giving more instruction. He's giving more understanding to the purpose behind giving, praying, and fasting. And Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness. Beware of giving, praying, fasting before men to be noticed by them. That's the key behind all of this, to be noticed by them. Jesus' instruction isn't that people shouldn't see us pray, fast, or give. It's that we don't do these things for the purpose of being seen. Posting the fitness selfie. Jesus is telling us, this is important, friend, Jesus is telling us it's not the mechanics of the Christian life that matters, it's the motive of the Christian life. It's the motive behind the mechanics. It's not just the what you do. Did I check the box and pray today? Did I give something today? Did I, am, am I fasting? And we're going to talk about exactly what fasting is here in just a moment. It's not just the mechanics of am I doing the Christian things or the spiritual practices that matters. It's the motive behind why am I doing those things. Because Jesus is drilling down yet again that the kingdom of God is not merely right behavior, it's right hearts. His kingdom is not about a group of people who are doing the right things. It's people who are doing right things for right reasons. That the kingdom of God is not behavior modification. The kingdom of God is not just AA or NA. The kingdom of God is not just don't mess up, be an awesome person, be perfect, be on your best behavior. The kingdom of God is people whose very motive, their very reason and motivation of their heart has been transformed because the grace of God met them at their darkest and at their worst and changed the nature of who they were. It's changed us from the inside out that it's not just what I do is different, but why I do it, the motivation behind doing it. And Jesus tells us something that is very important here, friends. He lets us know that God is not just taking note that we pray. He's not just taking note that we fast. He's not just, heaven is not just keeping record that we give, but heaven is keeping record of why we give. Wow. That there's, there is known and recorded in heaven, not just how much did you give, You say, well, God don't care how much I give. I beg to differ. Scripture says that Jesus stood against the wall in the temple and he watched as people gave. And he saw the widow give her last two mites and he saw the Pharisees give out of their wealth. He was watching. Heaven's not just keeping record of what we give, but why? The motive behind it, the heart that is behind the action. So the issue here. The issue that we're wrestling with here is this, that Jesus is saying, whose attention am I trying to get, man's or God's? When I do spiritual practice, when I do what, what, what the church fathers would call spiritual disciplines, when I'm praying, when I'm fasting, when I'm giving, 
when I am doing spiritual disciplines in Christian and practicing righteousness, whose attention am I trying to get? People's or God's? Here's a real practical way to think about this and to answer this. Do I pray only when people are listening? Or do I pray when only God is listening? Do I give only when people are watching? Do I give only when people can know how much I gave and that I'm a giver? Or do I give only when God is watching? Do I do righteous, Christian, spiritual, well-regarded, noble things when I have an audience or when God is the only audience? See, as a Christian, Jesus expects that his followers will be givers. He expects that his people will be people who pray. He expects that Christians will be people who fast. But even more that we do it, his expectation is that our motivation for doing it is is that we draw closer to God, not that the motivation is image and reputation. Okay, everybody's watching. I need to really pray the most spiritual sounding prayer that I can come up with because it'll make them think that I could be trusted with that promotion. Everybody's listening. I need to come up with something to really, our Father God, the creator of heaven and earth, most holy, divine, righteous judge of the souls of mankind, who sits high and looks low, who all power in heaven and earth is given unto thee. Thank you for our food. (laughs) Whose attention am I trying to get? Can I be content with God as the only witness of my practicing righteousness? Can I be content if I give, if I give generously, if I give to the point that I feel it and it hurts and nobody knows about it but God? Can I have genuine heartfelt prayer that changes things? That the kind of praying that James says, the effectual fervent, that word fervent means white hot. Can I, can I pray the kind of way that James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? Can I pray in such a way and nobody knows about it but God? Can I be a person who fasts? Not just because intermittent fasting is good for my health, but can I be a person who fasts because it's good for my spiritual health? And I don't blast it all over social media. It's just between me and God. Could I do the things that the Bible calls for Christians to do and nobody knows about it outside of heaven? This is what Jesus is speaking. Now, he tells us this. He says, we must choose who we want to be rewarded by, God or man. Understand this. God is not against you being rewarded. God is not an anti-reward person. God, God's not a, God is not anti-reward. You, you, you'll never, you shouldn't want rewards. Or you're never going to have rewards. Or It's just all that. No, no, no. It, it, here's what God is saying. Choose who you want to be rewarded by, man or God. Because who I want my rewards, who I want to be rewarded by, determines whose attention I'm trying to get. Anybody ever dated? Or courted? Froggy went in a courting? You see, you understand that if you've ever tried to date anybody or get married or engaged or flirt or anything like that. Who's att- who you want to be rewarded by determines whose attention you're trying to get. I won't tell the story on behalf of my wife of who was trying to get rewarded by who and whose attention someone was trying to get other than to say, I'm not the one who bought a red sequin shiny dress to sing 
shout to the Lord at a youth revival service. <laughs> Wasn't me. And I was so oblivious as a young preacher, I didn't know anything about it. I was thinking about my sermon. I got to preach here in about 30 minutes. My, uh, that, that's what I'm thinking about. And it wasn't until months later that I found out the dress was for Jesus. <laughs> it wasn't for shouting to the Lord, I can tell you that. Yeah. Wasn't thinking a thing about it. <laughs> who you want to be rewarded by determines whose attention you're trying to get. And so you and I need to, we need to keep this in front of us. If we're people of eternity, we need to keep this in front of us. Whose attention am I trying to get? Who do I want to be, re- do I want to be rewarded by this world? Do I want to be rewarded by people? Am I trying to be rewarded in the applause and the accolades of man? Do I want to just be well regarded by people? Do I want to fit into this world and people not think I'm crazy, people not think I'm a fanatic, people not think I'm out there, people, all the different things, you're, you're either too liberal or you're too MAGA or you're too conservative or you're this, you, you love this and you love that. Am I trying to just be rewarded and affirmed by the world by family, by friends, and that's whose attention I'm trying to get. Where am I living my life to be rewarded by God? That's whose attention I'm trying to get. Jesus tells us we must choose who we want to be rewarded by, man or God. If I'm doing spiritual things for the recognition of people, that's all I'm going to get is the recognition of people. In verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16, Jesus said, if I do spiritual things for the recognition of people, they have their reward in full. Have their reward in full. Literally, that, those, that phrase in the original Greek literally means balance paid in full. A receipt that's handed to you and the balance is paid in full. There's nothing more owed. What's he telling us? If I live my life, if I pray and if I give and if I fast and I use spiritual things, I use spiritual practices just to be well regarded in the eyes of man, I'm going to get attention and accolade from people, but God adds nothing to it. There is no reward, there is no blessing, there is no outpouring from heaven, there is no hand of God, there is no heavenly increase that is added to it. The attention and the accolades of people, that's all you get. God says, hey, you got what you wanted. There's nothing more than I can add to that because you just got your heart's desire. And how long does the reward of man, the attention of people last? It lasts about as long as their attention span. And here's how fickle that is. People can see you give and can hear you pray one Sunday and say, man, they are so spiritual. They're just Mr. Ninja Super Christian. They're like superhero holy and spiritual. I wish one day I could be like them. And then the next Sunday, if you get busy or forgetful or something, and you forget to shake their hand, well, they're just the snootiest in the world. Who do they think they are? My goodness. And all of a sudden, the attention and the accolades that you've got, it's been snatched away. You're not that anymore. Or people can see your posts on Facebook, your fitness selfies of your spiritual life. Man, I wish I was as close to God as they are. I wish I was always thinking about deep spiritual things the way that they are. And then they scroll up and see a funny joke or a recipe on Facebook and it's gone. They've moved on to the next thing. The awards, the rewards and the accolades and the intention of people just for your spiritual practices is empty and temporal. But Jesus tells us God gives rewards for righteous things done with righteous motives. God rewards righteous things that are done with righteous motives. In verse 4, 6, and 16, Jesus says, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your father who sees what is done in secret will 
reward you. That is a guarantee he will reward you. When we are praying in private, not for an audience of people, but for an audience of one, for an audience with the Lord, when we are giving, not to be rewarded by people, not for accolades and attention, but we're giving for, because it's the heart of God. When we are fasting, not for people to think we're so holy and we have so much commitment, but because it's our walk with God, He sees what is done in secret and He rewards it. God is a rewarder. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If I'm seeking Him rather than seeking people, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12 about his second coming, he said, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. He says, I'm taking note who's doing righteous things for righteous reasons. And there's a treasure trove of rewards that you may not have been rewarded here by people with gold and silver and attention and applause, but you will be rewarded by God and his rewards are eternal. His rewards are eternal. He says, you're not, you're not going to owe. Or he's not going to leave you in, in owing where he owes you anything. Balance paid in full. Every time you were praying in the middle of the night, driving down the road. Every time you were praying in heartbreak. Every time you were praying. In desperation, every time you prayed out of gratitude, every time you prayed out of thanksgiving, every time you prayed just because you wanted to be in fellowship with the Lord, heaven's keeping record of that. Every time you gave to bless somebody, every time you gave to advance the kingdom of God, every time you gave so more people could know Jesus, every time you gave and you were sacrificing There's something on your wish list you're not going to be able to do because you're giving to build the kingdom of God. Heaven records that. There may be even a need. Some of you, I I know that I've been there, Malia and I have been there. There's a time where you say, you know, we need to replace something in our home. But I feel the Holy Spirit saying, give. Give. And you're delaying buying a refrigerator. You're delaying buying a couch. You're delaying replacing your 27-inch TV that you've had since you were 19 years old. You're delaying that because there's a more important need in the kingdom of God. And you don't blast it around to everybody. Oh, look at me. You just do it. And heaven says, it may not have caught the attention of people, but it caught the attention of God. And these are the things that move him to bring rewards and blessings in our life. Now, then Jesus enumerates these three things. He said giving. Verse number two, Matthew 6, 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so your giving will be in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus is using extensive hyperbole. He's exaggerating on purpose here. Extensive hyperbole when he's talking about sounding a trumpet and your left hand not knowing what your right hand's doing. He is using this mechanism of extensive hyperbole to say kingdom people do not seek publicity for our generosity. It's not about us. I said, well, I, I would give, but I, I want people to know who gave it. I need my name attached to it. What Your name is, has no power. Why are, why are you concerned about your name living on? in generosity and not Jesus. Our name, our, listen, my name has no power. My name has no power. Jesus' name has all the power. Many years ago, I was preaching in another church on the other side of the state, and the only thing I remember about that church and that church service is how every piece of furniture, every furnishing in the building had a giving plaque plate screwed into it. Y'all seen these things? You know what I'm talking about? Gold or brass 
that had someone, who, the name of who gave this thing. Uh, every pew, the communion table, the pulpit, the minister stands behind, the windows, the window shades. I, I, I'm telling you, if there was a fly in the sanctuary, the wings of it, if you could see it, would say, Bilbo Baggins gave the money for this fly to be in this. Everything, everything, how we had to let anybody that may ever walk in this building know that the Jones family gave the $500 for this pew. And these are just the things we do because it's always what we've done and we don't think anything about it. It's just what we do. It's just what we do. If I'm going to give, I want my name attached to it. And Jesus says, what are you doing? It's not about your name. It's about His name. That we don't need to sound the alarm when we give in generosity. We don't need the pats on the back. We don't need to take out billboards. I gave to make this possible. Get YouTube down here and film it. I'm about to write a check. Now, we don't need our name to live on. We don't need our name to be shouted throughout the world. We don't need our name to go on through generations. It's the name of Jesus that we need to go through generations. It's the name of Jesus that we need to be proclaimed throughout the world. It's the name of Jesus that needs to live on. It's the name of, we're not building our kingdom. We're not building our empire. We're not building our throne. We're building the kingdom of Jesus. We're lifting his name higher. You can, if my name is lifted up, no men are are going to be drawn to Jesus, but if His name is lifted up, all men will be drawn to Him and be saved. What's He saying? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's not your left hand not know my, my right hand. Jesus is saying your left hand not know what your right hand. Well, that's impossible. Again, Jesus is using hyper, hyperbole. He's saying when we give, don't keep recalling it and gloating over it. Don't keep it in front of you, that you, eat, that you have to the best of your ability a lack of awareness of your own generosity. I'm not recalling it and playing it to where I become a legend in my own mind of generosity. I am so generous. I'm probably the most generous person I know. Then you need to know more people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about this verse, Jesus was sounding the death nail of the old man. Self-centeredness belongs to the old life, and new life in Christ is one of uncalculating generosity. Wow. See, God's kingdom is advanced through self-forgetfulness, not self-congratulation. The kingdom of God has advanced. The church of Jesus Christ has advanced from a sect of the Jewish religion into the most dominant force on the planet, not because His people walked through the land patting ourselves on the back, but because we said, it is not I that lives, but Christ in me. Then Jesus said, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. I say to you, they have the reward in full, but when you pray, go in your inner room and close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The word inner room that Jesus said is in the original Greek is the word tamion, tamion, tamion. The word tamion referred to a storeroom or a vault in a house where treasures were kept. It was the room in a home in the first century where the most valuable possessions of the family were kept, the family heirlooms, any gold or silver, any, any treasures that they may have, they kept them in the tamion. It was often the only room in the house that had a lock on it. What's Jesus telling us about prayer? He's telling us that your prayer life is a treasure. That your ability to have direct conversation with God is a treasure. It's not a trinket 
that we just parade out in front of people like something you got at five below. Which, anybody else's kids crazy about five below? God have mercy. Why didn't we start that? You know, I mean, it's one of those things like, I missed it. He said, prayer is not this meaningless, cheap thing that you just parade out as though it's insignificant. It's the greatest treasure that you have, the ability to communicate and converse with the creator of heaven and earth, the one who knows you the deepest and loves you the greatest. Understand this, the word tamion also evolved in its etymology. It evolved to mean the bedroom. That when Jesus is saying, go into the tamion and lock the door, he's talking about it's the image of either the vault, the treasure storehouse, or the bedroom. And he's talking about the intimacy between husband and wife that occurs behind closed door in the bedroom, that that is not something that is broadcast out in the city streets, that it is to be held sacred, and it is a private moment. It is a private relationship that there is real real fellowship, intimacy, and relationship that is not for public consumption. It is just for the building of fellowship. Jesus is saying this is what prayer is. It's not about what people think you are. It's about who you really are. It's about God sharing his heart with you and you sharing your heart with him. And it is to be held as though it is the most valuable possession that you have is the ability to talk and to be talked to by God. True prayer is not a technique. Well, I got to say the right words and I need to, you know, make sure that I pray the this prayer and pray the that prayer and I need to make sure that I'm facing toward Jerusalem and that I pray first thing in the morning or I pray last thing at night. No, prayer, real prayer is not a technique and it's not a performance. It's fellowship. And then Jesus said this, last thing, Matthew 6, 16. Jesus said, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. They intentionally look dirty. They intentionally look as though they are impoverished and malnourished when they're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, but you, when you fast, that's an emphasis there, meaning an expectation that his people will fast. Anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When Jesus said, anoint your head and wash your face, he's talking specifically about the application of olive oil that was a custom of the time to use the fresh olive oil, uh, the, the, the second or third batch of olive oil that they would make. The first pressing was for holy purposes, but the second or third pressing that was used to wash and brighten one's face and to use to scrape the dead skin cells off of their face and make their appearance be better. It it, it would be like this, put your makeup on. Any ladies that, you know, I'm not going to the grocery store without my face on? There's one or two of you. I'm not condemning you. I'm not going to throw my boot at you. You vain wretch! No, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if you're going to fast, don't go to Food City intentionally trying to look gaunt. Don't go out in public intentionally trying to look, oh, that is the most pious, devout, spiritual Christian that I have ever seen. They are so close to the Lord. They are so committed. I said, wash your face. Put some olive oil on your face. Get yourself cleaned up. Fasting is not something that people should say, oh, God bless you. I feel so sorry for you. It's not a, it's not a burdensome in, uh, uh, weight that you carry. Jesus is saying fasting is not a time for people to feel sorry for you. Fasting is to be a joyous occasion between you and the Lord. But what is fasting? Let me give you a quick working definition. Fasting is intentionally depriving myself of routine pleasures 
to eliminate distractions so that I can more clearly discern God's direction. And there are two major things that the, that the New Testament is using when it's talking about fasting. It's food and water and sex between husband and wife. Usually when I say that, you can hear men like, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> fasting is intentionally depriving myself. I want you to understand this. There's some misconceptions about fasting. Fasting is not you twisting God's arm. Fasting is you eliminating distractions so you can more clearly discern God's direction for your life. He's not saying, man, I've been saying no to your prayer, but you're giving up chocolate chip cookies. I have to say yes now. And bread, holy cow, double portion. Fasting is not about you twisting God's arm and manipulating Him to come over to your side of the prayer request. Fasting is saying that trying to get God's direction for my life is the most important thing, even more important than food. That in this season of my life right now, I'm, I'm more focused on hearing God's direction for my life that that is more important than food, more important than drink, more important than entertainment, more important than any other pleasures in this life. There's nothing right now in this season that is more important than me knowing God's direction for my life. You're eliminating, you're canceling out the background noise. A couple days ago we're at the house and one kid has the TV on, another kid has an iPad blaring, Dogs barking, other stuff going on. Malia's on the other end of the house in the kitchen trying to tell me something. Phone starts ringing. You know, earthquake and the caverns of the deep open up, all the kind of stuff. I'm like, I can't hear a word you are trying to say. I've got it. everybody in this house shut up. Put the dog outside. Turn the TV off so I can hear what you're saying. That's fasting. It's not that God's not speaking. It's not that God hasn't been speaking to you. It's that there's so much other stuff and other noise that's going on in your life. You can't clearly hear what he is saying. Fasting cuts the TV off and all of the background noise where right now the voice of God is the only thing I need to hear. And Jesus says there's an expectation that you'll do this. That it's not something that needs to be calendarized every Monday or every Thursday. If, if the Holy Spirit tells you to do that, then do it. But it's as God draws you into it. And he says when you do it just to increase your fellowship with the Lord because you value his voice, God's taken note and he rewards so as we get ready to pray this morning, here's the, the question is this, am I living my life for people's attention or for God's attention? Am I living my life for the world's rewards? Am I living my life so this world may say, well done? So the people I work with will say, well done? Pop culture will say, well done? Or am I living my life for my heavenly Father God to say, well done? well done all the times you gave and it wasn't recognized he'll say I recognized it all the times you prayed and you weren't getting all the pats on the back God says I saw it and I heard it and here's the rewards can you bow your heads with me this morning thank you Jesus Lord, we thank you that you take note of our lives. You take note, not just of what we do, but why we do it. The reasons, the motivations. Lord, I pray right now for everyone here. Who maybe we realize our life is being lived for the wrong 
audience and the wrong rewards. Maybe we realize today that we're living our life for the things of this world and not for the things of heaven. Maybe somewhere we've gotten off track. And you're speaking to us today, we need to come back to a life that is more focused on eternity than the here and now. That as you said, Jesus, you are coming quickly and your reward is in your hand. Friend, those words are as significant today as they were when Jesus said them. He's coming quickly. And I want to give you the opportunity in this room to say, that's a scary thought for me, preacher. Jesus is coming quickly because I'm not ready to meet him. I'm not ready to stand before him. If Jesus come quickly and I was to stand before him either through his coming for the church or I stood before him by means of death, if I stood before him, it would be, I hope I've done enough good. I hope that maybe I said the right thing. I hope that maybe how much of a committed Christian my parents or my grandparents would would account for that, make up for me. Friend, none of that is what matters. When you stand before Jesus, it's have you committed your life to him? Have you confessed sin and turned from it? And have you placed your abiding trust in the sinless life of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection? And committed yourself to obeying his word? It's not about are you a good person. None of us can ever be good enough on our own. It's trusting in his goodness to make you right before God. And if you're here in this room right now and say, Pastor Rich, today's the day they don't want to give my life to Jesus. I don't want to be in question. I don't want to live in doubt or wonder. But today's the day I want it written down. Today's the day I said yes to Jesus. I'm going to give you this chance right now. Lift your hand high toward heaven. Today's the day right here. I want heaven to record it. That on October, October the 22nd, 2023, I gave my life to Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, can we all give God a big hand clap of praise this morning because he's so good? Amen. Well, give it up for Pastor again. What an amazing word that was today. One of the, my favorite points that he just said there is, is it, 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 the Bible doesn't say if you pray, if you fast, if you give. It says when you pray, when you fast, and when you give. And I believe there's a fourth aspect of that too. It says when you come to church because you got to have a place to learn how to pray, to fast, and to give. Well, guess what? That's my job right here. When you come to church next Sunday, it is Baptism Sunday. Woo woo! It's going to be Baptism Sunday, and we are excited here at Connection to walk this journey that is called Life With You to take this next step. If you are interested in getting baptized, if you just gave your heart to the Lord and you're going on to your Christian walk and you're interested in being baptized, let's do it. Let's take this step together. Reach out to some of the pastoral staff, some of our key leaders, and we will help you out with that. But at this